Well, you, you came on the right Sunday because I got cookies for you. If you read your bulletins, you probably knew there was cookies involved in this message. But uh, I remember when I was growing up, and uh, my dad would give me commands. He would say, you need to go out and mow the lawn. And uh, <laughs> um, when he said that, when I was growing up, I did that. And if, if I looked at him and if, if I said to him, what are you going to give me if I mow the lawn? If I, if I even asked him that, what are you going to give me? The answer would always be a beating. <laughs> so I was smart enough to know that, uh, you know, I, I didn't ask him that question. Um, you know, other kids... It was funny because I grew up in a different generation. Uh, and I've said this before, my parents were a lot older when they had me. And a lot of the people that were my age, um, their mom and dads were a lot younger when they had them. So it was kind of, uh, they were kind of, they grew up hippie-esque. And uh, I remember coming to school when we'd get our report cards. My, my, the students around me used to go, oh, my dad gives me $5 for every A. And my dad gives me three dollars for every B, and he gives me, you know, and, and I said, "Oh wow!" And they're like, "What do you get?" And I said, "Well, if I pass everything, I don't get beat. <laughs> That's what I get." But um, one of the things that happened, there was a paradigm shift in our in our, our nation, and 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 I think it came with the abundance that we walk in as Americans. And the paradigm shift became teaching children, and now it's translated into adults, and it goes along with the American dream, teaching them that if you do something, you get a cookie. That you get a reward. That there's always an incentive. And because of it, now there's a generation out there that before they will do anything, they need to know what their incentive is. Right. It's not just enough to do what you're told or to complete the tasks that need to be done. How many of you have ever received a thank you note from the IRS? <laughs> Has anybody ever got, you know, you pay your taxes and all of a sudden you get this nice little note? Hi, this is Uncle Sam, and I just want to thank you. Um, that doesn't happen. But we expect incentives sometimes for doing things. And, and uh, one of the problems with Christianity in, in, in a modern text, in a modern setting, is the fact that a lot of Christians expect cookies. A lot of Christians expect incentives. Like God is saying, okay, if you do this, I'll do that. If you do this, I'll do that. Now, I want to, uh, I want to just uh, preface this by saying this. The Bible does teach us that if we walk in obedience to God, we walk in blessing. Yes. If we walk in obedience to God, we walk in blessing. But it doesn't teach us that that blessing is always going to be something specific or a certain cookie. Some people, some people teach you know, and you turn on the TV. Do you, you ever get like have a night where you can't sleep? You're like up at three o'clock in the morning. You're just like, oh, uh, maybe you got an ache or a pain, or your back's killing you. you. You go and sit down. You turn on that TV, and there's always some dumb preacher on, and he's always looking in the camera, and he's always like. Let me tell you right now, brother or sister, God wants to do work in your life. And part of the reason that He can't do that work is because you ain't sowed your biggest seed yet. 
And when you sow that big seed, God's going to pour a truckload of cookies out on you. Hallelujah. <laughs> And I've been there. I've been there myself. And a lot of times I go, I don't want those cookies. <laughs> I've even written out checks in the middle of the night and sent them off the next day. <laughs> My cookies didn't come. But that turkey on TV wouldn't quit sending me mail every week, I tell you. That. Number one, the enemy knows that most people are just living for cookies. The enemy knows that most people are just living for cookies. Most people just want that incentive. Most people just want to serve because, well, if I do this, I'm going to get this. God's going to bless me with, with this. And, and the enemy loves that because when we put our eye on the cookie... We take our eyes off the Master. And I have seen more people walk away from Christianity, walk away from church, because they got cookie eyes. They thought if they did this and if they did that, then God had to do such and such. And when it didn't happen... All of a sudden, I didn't get my cookie. I'm done. We don't serve God for cookies. Job chapter 1, verses 6 through 12. One day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan, the accuser, came with them. Where have you come from? The Lord asked Satan. Satan answered the Lord, I've been going back and forth across the earth, watching everything that's going on. The Lord asked Satan, Have you noticed my servant Job? He's the finest man in all the earth, a man of complete integrity. He fears God and will have nothing to do with evil. Satan replied to the Lord, Yeah, Job fears God, but not without good reason. You have loaded that cat with cookies. He says, You've always protected him and his home and his property from harm. You have made him prosperous in everything he does. Look how rich he is, but take away everything he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. What's the enemy saying here? Take away the perks. Take away the incentives. Take away the cookies. And Job's going to curse you. Because he only serves you for the blessings. All right. You may test him, the Lord said to Satan. Do whatever you want with everything he possesses. But don't harm him physically. So Satan left the Lord's presence. Now, there's a few interesting things here. One, one is the enemy is asking God for permission, basically, to mess with Job. Can I have permission to mess with this person? Because you know what? Job was a righteous man. What does that mean? That means Job was God's. If you're following Jesus, if you've asked Jesus to come into your life, to forgive you for your sins, you've repented, you've turned your life to Him. You're following God. You're God's property. And the devil can't mess with you unless he gets God's permission. Do you remember in the New Testament, the devil did the same thing that he did about Job with Peter. Because what did Jesus say to Peter? Satan has desired to sift you like wheat. So Jesus knew that the devil had been in the heavenlies going, I can take him down. He's an idiot. He sticks his foot in his mouth. I watched him walk on the water. I saw when he said that you were the son of God, turned around and said they weren't going to let anybody crucify you. 
<laughs> Give me him, I'll, I'll destroy him. You know, the devil did. The devil did try to destroy him. He denied Christ three times. He heard that rooster crow. And I'm pretty sure he thought he was over. But on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit filled him, he got up and preached a sermon which 3,000 men accepted Jesus Christ that day. And that was the birth of the church. Jesus said, upon this rock, I'll build my church. And so, one of the things that we have to remember is the enemy, the enemy knows that a lot of people are just living for cookies. And one of the ways that he gets to us is he gets to us by taking something away from us or by, by trying to interfere with something that God is doing. Or by, you know, the, the, the first thing that he does, really, more than taking our possessions is he tries to steal our hope. Now, I'm going to tell you something a little bit about Job before we move on here. Job's heart was right with God, and he was a righteous man, but because of his wealth, his family was not righteous. The book of Job begins with him going out by himself to make sacrifice to God because his children are at home celebrating their birthdays. Which, if you're a Jew, you don't celebrate your birthday. That's a pagan rite of passage at that time. And Job was going to make sacrifice for them because they were ungodly. So in a sense, he was covering his children. And one of the things we don't always, we don't always realize is God uses adversity in our lives. Sometimes... To better us. One of the problems that, that Job had, that when you read through this book, and, and you may not see it until you get to the end, but in the end, Job repents of something. It's arrogance. It's arrogance and self-righteousness. He realizes every good thing comes from the Father. And so, so the enemy wants to the enemy wants to sometimes make sure that we're just living for cookies, and sometimes the enemy won't interfere with our cookies, because if we are living for cookies and we get cookies, then he knows that someday when the cookies don't come, we're gonna walk away. And other times the enemy does interfere with our cookies because he wants to make sure that we don't get that incentive. Number two, Jesus tried to tell us. That the kingdom of God isn't about storing cookies. Jesus tried to tell us that the kingdom of God isn't about storing cookies. Luke chapter 18, verses 18 through 23. And, and I bet most of you could tell me this story by heart. It's the story of the rich young ruler. I had a guy one day who said, I think that rich young ruler was Paul. And there's no way that that could ever be proven, but, uh, but it would make it an interesting story. But once a religious leader asked Jesus this question, good teacher, what should I do to get eternal life? Who doesn't want eternal life? He would have to be a moron to pass that one up. I want eternal. I want to, tell me you want to live forever and go to heaven and be with Jesus. That's awesome. It's what everybody wants. Well, the first thing Jesus says to him is in verse 19, why do you call me good? Jesus asked. Only God is truly good. Well, there's two things that Jesus is doing. Number one, this man is trying to butter Jesus up. And this man is important. So when an important person pays you a compliment in a public place, what does that do? It makes you important too. So here the rich young ruler goes, Good teacher. My stamp of approval. Isn't that wonderful, Jesus? <coughs> Here's the deal though. Number one, 
you're dealing with somebody who doesn't have an ego. And Jesus said, why do you call me good? There's none good but God. And right away, I think that shot him down a little bit like, oh, well, the butter up method isn't working. But the other thing that Jesus was doing was this. <laughs> he was also telling that guy, you know who I am if you're calling me a good teacher. Because there is no good but God. So he's also making a preference saying, if I'm good, I'm God. And what I have to say should be very important to you. Well, he asked him, what can I do to have this eternal life? And Jesus says, ask for your question. He said, you know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not testify falsely and honor your father and mother. And here's the thing. Some people wonder <clears throat> why Jesus didn't list all ten commandments. Do you ever wonder that? How come he said you know the commandments and then he went through these specific commandments with this individual? Because I think, and this is my opinion, not scripture, so I know some guys are like, I will step out behind the pulpit when I say this. <laughs> Which is ridiculous. I think that what Jesus was doing was listing the commandments that this rich young ruler had obeyed and leaving out the commandments that he hadn't. Just the commandments that he'd obeyed. He hadn't committed adultery. He hadn't murdered. He didn't steal. He was a very honest person. And he honored his father and mother. He'd done those things. And he was eager to say that to Jesus. This man replied, I've obeyed all these commandments since I was a child. But there's still one thing you lack. Jesus said, <laughs> sell all you have and give the money to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. But when the man heard this, he became sad because he was very rich. He put his money above God and his possessions. So he couldn't he couldn't say that he followed the commandment that said, I am the Lord your God. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. As a matter of fact, he probably made an idol out of his possessions. Which could either be money and the images on the money or the graven images around his house that he had possessed. He loved having stuff and he probably loved having stuff other people had that he thought was pretty amazing, which would actually deal with coveting. And he probably was such a busy man that he didn't always have time to, you know, necessarily keep the Sabbath like he should. As we look at his life and as we look at this challenge Jesus gave him, we can find where these missing commandments could easily fall under the one thing that he's not surrendered. And so Jesus just gives him this challenge. Just says, hey, this is simple, man. You're a good person. That's awesome. All you got to do now is just sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and follow me. And the Bible says he went away sad because he was very rich. You see, he wasn't looking for God. He was looking for eternal life. He wasn't looking for a relationship with Jesus. He was a very happy and content man with all that he had. And he just wanted to find a place where he could keep it and store it forever. A place where he could 
stuff is cookies. Number three. God didn't call us to wealth and success. He called us to service and sacrifice. God didn't call us to wealth and success. He called us to service and sacrifice. I, I think sometimes we get confused with the calling of God. When God blesses us, He blesses us to be a conduit. He blesses us so that we can take that blessing and bless others. And the wildest thing is, in the kingdom of God, the people who are the wealthiest and the richest are the ones who give the most. And that's true. People who are givers in the kingdom, God usually blesses them with wealth because they're willing to be a conduit. They're willing to give what God has given them and, and use it for the glory of His kingdom. But they're not typically selfish people. Because God doesn't bless us with, with things just so we can have things. He doesn't say, hey, I want you to have more cookies than anybody else, man. And it probably looks like I have had more cookies than anybody else. But the truth is, God wants to bless us so that we can bless others. My sister was a terrible, terrible person. When she was a little girl, and my parents would buy my brother and sister candy bars, my brother would inhale his. He would... <laughs> and my sister would always wait until his was gone. And then she would slowly open hers. She'd be like, mm, this looks so good. And he'd be like, oh. he was like a dog. You ever give a dog meat? Cute little fluffy dog. Like, he takes some meat out. All of a sudden, this is like, like a poodle, a big fluffy permed poodle. They just become teeth when they see me. It's like, ah, Something happens to dogs when they see meat. And, and you know, when, when like Bender's around and we've got meat, and I'm like, you want a piece? You want a piece? Ah, look. I'm like, did he even taste that? I don't, do dogs enjoy food? Because I wonder, they, they, they never seem to chew or taste. Have you ever seen a dog go, Woof. <laughs> that doesn't happen. And then, you know, it's it's horrible because my brother is kind of like Bender's, like my brother. You give him something. Sometimes we'll like put dog food out right before we eat so that he won't bug us. But by the time we sit down and eat, he's done, and he's already sitting there waiting. <laughs> Got mine, yours now. Yours. But my sister would, would would tantalize my brother with this candy bar. And then she would say, You know what? I could split this with you. But uh, it's my week to do the dishes. <laughs> and uh, I'll give you half this candy bar if you do the dishes this week. And so she would she had the bill. <laughs> My brother would eat that candy bar and then regret it every day for seven days. But but sometimes we we get that feeling. We get that feeling sometimes in our life like we're missing something or like we're and part of the reason we feel that way is because we are not appreciating what we have. Have you given your heart to Jesus Christ and asked Him to be your Lord and Savior? Let me tell you something. Even if you live the rest of your life in poverty, you're already living a better life. Amen. Has He come and redeemed you? You're going to live forever. And it doesn't matter what kind of hardships you suffer through. and It doesn't matter what kind of things you have to face. Even to the point of death. 
You don't have to worry. That's what uh, one of the early church fathers was brought before one of the Roman emperors. And the Roman emperor said to him, If you don't renounce Christ, you will die. And the man just looked at him and said, Haven't you heard? Death is dead. Jesus is risen. Amen. And you can't kill me. You can kill my body, but you can't kill me. And he was walking with what he had. He's walking, you know, think about that. Somebody's looking him in the face saying, I will kill you if you don't renounce Christ. He's like, death is dead. You can't kill me. We get a sore on our toe and we go, oh my goodness. Lord Jesus, help me. Oh. Why would you give me this burden, God? You know, I can't bear it. Oh, are you ready to take me home? Oh, I'm so excited to go. Can't you tell? I mean, we do. We throw a fit where we're, you know, these bold servants of God. So we don't always realize what we have. 1 Timothy 6, 6 and 10. It says, yet true religion with contentment is great wealth. True religion with contentment is great wealth. What is true religion? Well, according to James, it's taking care of orphans and widows in their time of need. It's serving God. It's keeping yourself unspotted from the world. Those are the things James says. So by loving others and serving others and keeping ourselves unspotted from the world by walking with God, if we can learn how to be content with that, we'll learn that we have amassed wealth that is beyond anything anyone could ever have or anyone could ever own. It says, after all, we don't bring anything with us when we came into the world. Now, you didn't, other than an umbilical cord, and you cut that off. <laughs> we certainly cannot carry anything with us when we die. You can't. You can try to grip it, but the mortician will just unpry your hands. <laughs> so if we have enough food and clothing, let us be content. But people who long to be rich fall into temptation. They're trapped by many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. You ever wonder, sometimes, sometimes they oh man, I'm just so poor, it seems I can never make it, I can never get ahead, I'm always under. And maybe there's a reason for that. Maybe your soul's being saved that way. Maybe if you had money, you would walk away from trusting God every day. God gives, God gives blessings to those who can handle it. And if you can't handle it, God will bless you with a huge one. So, you know, learn to handle it. Um, <laughs> but it says, you know, sometimes we fall into traps, foolish, harmful desires plunge us into ruin and dis destruction because the love of money, verse 10, is at the root of all kinds of evil. Now, money's not evil. Money's paper. Money's worthless paper, basically. It doesn't have any value to it other than what we pretend it has. Our money in America is just pretend money. It's monopoly money. But it's got our presidents on it and not the little guy with the monocle so we can spend it in places. But the love of money is at the root of all kinds of evil. You shouldn't love money because money can't do anything for you. It can buy lots of stuff. But only God can protect you. Only He can save you. Only He can make your life better. Money doesn't make anybody's life better. As a matter of fact, I, I know some people who uh, were blessed, kind of blessed, maybe not so much blessed. They won a contest out of a cereal box. And they got $100,000. And uh, about six months later, they got a divorce. Uh, one of the kids wrecked their new four-wheeler and broke the neck. Um, yeah, there was a lot of bad stuff that happened. I was praying for this big blessing, and when they got it, tragedy hit. The family was torn apart. I think sometimes we don't realize, hey, you know what? You talk about, uh, you talk about people who struggle, people who are poor. And if you ever went through a time in your life where you really, really struggled, 
a lot of times people look back and say, that was some of the best times of our lives. Because you were recognizing God's hand every day. Every day we recognize God's hand when He's all we have to depend on. He's all we need. And some people don't always understand that. And uh, it's hard. It's hard. But some people, second part of verse 10 here, craving money have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. Some people craving money have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. I know a, a gentleman who had a great deal of wealth. He also had a great deal of bitterness. And he would watch God work miracles in people's lives. And, and one day he came to me and he said, you know so and so, they got healed of this. And it makes me mad. Because I had to go to the doctor and I had to get an operation to take care of my problem and it cost me $50,000. And I said to him, did you have $50,000? Well, yeah. I said, you know, so-and-so doesn't have anything. I said, all they have is God. And all of a sudden I think maybe, I don't know if it did or not, he seemed like he was still cranky afterwards, but <laughs> might, have, might have stuck in there somewhere that maybe there's a reason. If you have, use what you have. If you don't, trust in God. Number four, my last point. As Christians, we come into maturity when we stop being cookie-led and we start being spirit-led. As Christians, we come into maturity when we stop being cookie-led cookie. and start being spirit-led. One of the things that ruins new Christians, babes in Christ, is when, is when a Christian will say, Oh, well, you have to do this because God's going to bless you if you do this. and You're going to get blessed if you do this. And, and if you do this, and oh, your, your maturity needs to be this way. And a lot of times, baby Christians start doing stuff because go, if I do this, then I get this big blessing. And, uh, you know, if I come to Sunday night church, God's really going to bless me. And you come to Sunday night church and you're like, oh, man, that was really boring and I missed once upon a time. Why did I do that? <laughs> And after a while, you realize that some of the cookies aren't there. But that's not the reason you follow God. That's not the reason you press into God. The reason you press into God is because knowing Him, knowing Him is the greatest honor and privilege that you could ever have. There is nothing that He could give you or bestow you with or bless you with that is greater than just being able to abide in His presence. And that's what heaven's about. That's what, you know, it's not the, it's not the reward is not eternal life. <coughs> because if, if our eternal life was life like we have it now, when you start going downhill, the older you get... Uh, eternal life would kind of stink. You know, I just want to die! The reward is being in the presence of God for eternity. Knowing His love and His peace and His joy. Having the mind of Christ. That's what we look forward to. Galatians 5, 16 through 18 says, So I advise you to live according to your new life in the Holy Spirit. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The old sinful nature loves to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Holy Spirit wants. The Spirit gives us desires that are opposite from what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other. And your choices are never free 
from this conflict. I want you, I want you to read that again. Listen to this. Your choices are never free from this conflict. If somebody comes to you and says, my flesh does not struggle with my spirit anymore, they have not reached a higher spiritual plane. They have come into mental illness of some sort. <laughs> Don't trust what they're saying, because it's not what the Scripture says. My flesh is always craving and desiring things that my spirit needs to draw. My spirit needs to overcome. And my spirit can't overcome them. It can't. But the Holy Spirit can. And the Holy Spirit living in me gives me the strength to say, down, boy. Down, flesh. Verse 18 says, when you are directed by the Holy Spirit, you're no longer subject to the law. The reason you're no longer subject to the law is because the law of God is working in you. God's Holy Spirit is leading you, guiding you, and taking you every step of the way. So my challenge to you today is just this. I challenge you to be spirit-led. To do things without seeking a reward. To do things just because you love God. Just because He's your Father and He cares about you and you want to get closer to Him. Don't say, well, if I do this, I can get on somebody's good side. Or if I do this, I can do this. Just do things because God has called you to do them. And don't ask for cookies. Because if Christ is living in you, man, there's nothing greater that He could ever give you. 2,000 years ago when He shed His blood on the cross, He gave you everything. Yes. Everything. Just so that you could have that eternity together. What a wonderful God we serve. Let's bow our heads. With every head bowed this morning, I'm going to ask you just to respond to this internally inside of yourself. I'm not going to embarrass anybody today, but maybe some of you here would say, you know, God, I've been living for cookies. Lord, I've been looking for those rewards, and I've been looking for this, and I've been looking for that, and I've been constantly looking for validation and things that, Lord, I just need to press on. I need to trust you, and I need to just realize that godliness with contentment is great gain. Lord, teach me today to be satisfied with my relationship with you. And if I'm not, Lord, teach me to press into you. To have that devotional time every day. To have that time where I separate myself from this world so that I can learn the joy of being in your presence. Lord, help us today to put you above all things. Help us today to honor you and serve you with all of our hearts, all of our minds, and all of our spirits. In Jesus' name.